Okay, I think that we can start now. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for participating. On behalf of MedWet, I'm really happy to welcome you all to the fifth and last webinar of this series. Uh, I will repeat some technical information before starting. Please note that this webinar is being recorded for a later upload to our website. And just please note again that to follow the webinar in your preferred language, you can click on the interpretation icon and then select the language English or French. Um, please also remember to turn off the microphone um, and then you, there will be the opportunity to make uh, questions to the speakers, but in the second moment at the end of their presentation. Um, so my name is uh, Flavio Monti, and I'm the manager of the scientific and technical network of MedVet. And today, together with me, there is also our focal point of the Mediterranean Ramsar Site Managers Network, Mrs. Sana Mezugi, and Mrs. Mr. Abder Mari, the MedVet Communication Officer. Uh, this webinar is the fifth of the series of online webinars that aim to stimulate knowledge sharing and uh, wetlands managers' participation while addressing various topics and challenges related to wetland conservation and management in the Mediterranean region. The webinars are organized by MedWet under the MAVA uh, M3 project uh, entitled Disseminating Knowledge and Sharing Experience for promoting wetlands and conservation around the Mediterranean and are mostly held by members of the MedWet Scientific and Technical Network, uh, which is a network of top scientists and experts on wetland related issues from the Mediterranean region, working through five different specialist groups in key subject areas and providing scientific and technical support, not only to the MedWet member countries, but also to the work of the Ramsar Convention. So I think that uh, Sana can share the link uh, directly on the, on the chat about the STN. Some words about uh, this series, because the series is principally dedicated to wetland managers and NGO representatives uh, and open to all key hectares in wetlands conservations that play an important role uh, on the ground to conserve our common wetlands. Uh, Probably you already know, but to support them in their mission, MedWet has also recently established the network of Mediterranean Ramsar sites managers, uh, which brings together wetland conservation practitioners associated to Ramsar sites in order to promote change in policy and action on the ground, uh, with many people dedicated to fostering to best management practices, knowledge exchange, and public education about wetlands values and services. So I think that Sana will share also the link to the uh, network of Mediterranean Ramsar site managers that you already probably uh, know. And uh, before starting, I just briefly recall that this is the last webinar, but the other four have been already done. Um, for those who did not have the chance to participate to the previous webinars, uh, I just uh, say that you can find recording on our website of coastal wetland managers. And Sana, sorry, but once again, uh, Sana will share the link on the chat if you would like to, uh, to see uh, to, um, uh, the, the previous uh, webinars. Uh, the webinar scheduled today, uh, thank you Sana, is about exploring climate change impacts on Mediterranean coastal wetlands, risk and challenges. Uh, today, we will learn about relevant processes to describe ongoing and future climate change and its effects, including key findings from recent EPCC reports, the impact of water resource and implication for sustainable water use in the Mediterranean basin. Uh, we will also speak about the Nazareth Basin solution and how they can really help coastal communities prepare for and cope with and recover from natural hazards uh, related to climate change. Uh, we are pleased to have with us today two of the greatest experts in this sector that I'm going to briefly introduce. Um, the first speaker of the day is, is Dr. Alessio Satta, who is the coordinator of MedWet 
and at the same time, president and co and founder of the MEDC Foundation. We will speak about adapting to climate change and coastal hazards through natural basis solutions. Uh, Alessio Satta has more than 25 years of experience in climate change and sustainable development policies and governance. With almost 20 years of experience in international development assistance to the MEP countries in the field of coastal and marine resource conservation and management. Uh, Alessio's got his PhD on climate change science and management at the University of Venice and is now an active researcher on climate change risk and vulnerability assessment. As I mentioned before, he's also a founder of the MedC Foundation, which is an Italian non-profit organization which aims at protecting Mediterranean marine and coastal ecosystems uh, through a direct conservation action and blue innovation. Uh, I would say personally uh, that I have the pleasure to know Alessio and he is a charismatic character which embraces various interests and shows strong diplomatic skills that he always put at the service of international cooperation and innovative approach um, to conservation and to sustainable development. So thank you Alessio to being with us today. And uh, the second speaker of the day instead is Dr. Antonio Trabuco. Uh, who is actually a permanent research scientist at the Euro Mediterranean Center on Climate Change uh, under the Department of Impacts on Agriculture, Forest and Ecosystem Services Division. Um, Antonio today will speak about climate change and challenges on water resources in the Mediterranean areas. A few words about Antonio. Uh, Antonio research interests mostly cover climate, of course, from regional to global scale ecosystem services and their alteration uh, due to climate and global drivers linked to land use, policy and economic development scenarios. Um, Antonio has been heavily engaged in the development of several global climate data sets, analyzing climate change impact on several environmental aspects related to ecosystem distribution and production, species distribution, but also vegetation functioning crop yields contributing in advancing, in advancing towards sustainable development goals. Uh, Antonio has an international working experience. I just navigated through his uh, CV and uh, I was really amazed seeing that he spent many years around the globe in all the continents. He uh, traveled and worked in China, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Kenya, India, Costa Rica, USA and Europe. So managing and experience many commitments, interaction, communication and presentation in coordination with many uh, culturally diverse working groups. Uh, as he says, to be effective, uh, scientific research requires interaction and the capacity to identify and enforce collaborations. So, uh, which is exactly also in the direction of uh, MedWet uh, initiatives. So we are really honored to have Antonio with us today for the uh, second part of the webinar. Um, so I think that we can now start with the first speaker of the day, uh, Alessio Sata presenting adapting to climate change and coastal hazards through natural based solution. Uh, so, uh, Please, Alessio, the floor is yours. And to ask a question, you can just click on the raise the end bottom at the bottom of the screen, or if you prefer, just write your question directly in the chat. Okay? So, Alessio, um, please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Flavio. I know that will be very hard for you to believe, but I didn't pay Flavio for all these beautiful words. And first of all, his, con his contract for the next year is secure. So Flavio, don't worry, <laughs> you will continue collaborating with Medwet. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm, that, I'm, I'm very happy and I wish to, to take this opportunity to thank Antonio, which is the real expert here, uh, to, to have accept this invitation. We, we collaborate with Antonio, we are very happy to do that. And with the Euro Mediterranean Center for Climate Change, which is you know, one of the main center in Europe, for uh, climate change studies. So uh, we are very honored to have Antonio with us and thanks again and, and I hope you will enjoy. So I actually, um, you will just um, have some information, uh, some basic information that will be in the presentation of Antonio. Uh, we, for, for some reasons we had to 
uh, to to have this uh, sequence of of presentation. So I will just uh, go try to go straight to the point in terms of uh, risk, vulnerabilities, and hazards, and also which are, which is basically the role of wetlands, which is definitely our main focus as Medwet and uh, also in the work that we try to do with you. And we are very happy to have you on board. We are very happy that we have started this collaboration with all Ramsar managers and practitioners. For us, it's the real added value of our job. So we believe that this has to be consolidated more and more. And this is, of course, an opportunity. But as Medwet, we are always open uh, to exchange. And also with our partners, we see some some of our colleagues and partners from BedLife with whom we, we collaborate in this uh, uh, project of. So I, I like to, to say hello to Sofia, to Joanna. Uh, we, we work together in this big wet, wetland-based solution project uh, funded by MAVA and climate change is definitely one of the, uh, the pillar and the climate wetland nexus, I would say, uh, in the sense how wetlands are uh, hi, Joanna. <laughs> are productive, uh, very much efficient in terms of uh, one side stocking blue carbon, on the other side, uh, supporting and helping our communities to adapt to climate change. So I will basically give an overview of, of concepts. So uh, as Flavio said, of course, we will have uh, an open uh, room for, for questions, but please don't hesitate to write your question if something is not clear to stop me and also write it in the chat. Uh, I'll ask to Susanna or Flavio to intercept the questions or maybe I'll stop and, and, and give clarification. Uh, but then I, I'd very much like to, uh, to have an exchange with you and, and just take it as a start of, for a new collaboration and also to understand from your side which are the needs in terms of uh, climate adaptation. For example, how Medwet can provide more support to your uh, daily work in, in climate adaptation. Uh, so I'll start sharing my, my um, presentation just as a support for, uh, just tell me uh, it should be okay. So I made uh, just a little, uh, um, a slight change in the title um, as of course uh, we will very much focus on coastal risk and uh, we are in the Mediterranean uh, we are very much working with marine and coastal wetlands according uh, to the Ramsar definition we are also uh, the, the network of Ramsar manager started with coastal managers. Why? What? Just because uh, it was like quite more natural. Is of course, as you may know, uh, the network of Ramsar site managers is open to all the Ramsar sites that are uh, in the uh, contracting parties that are in the air, in, let's say included in, in the contracted parties of Medved that are 27. And, but we consider that in terms of climate uh, mitigation and adaptation, we should have focus on the, the so-called Mediterranean watershed, in which also the Mediterranean climate uh, has some uh, commonalities and, uh, and, and, and some issues that are, of course, uh, experienced by most of you, uh, both in the eastern, western, southern, north rim of the Mediterranean. So, uh, that's why uh, today we will very much focus on coastal issues and, uh, and also the so-called coastal hazards that are related to climate forcing. Huh? Okay, so um, ju just first of all, uh, cr uh, create a context. Coastal populations, uh, we are all aware about the dramatic increase of population uh, and the so called demographic vulnerabilities, migration, uh, and many others. Climate change that seems, uh, but uh, uh, Antonio will give you definitely more details on this, even 
accelerating its path, uh, also according to models that 10 years ago were like under predicting <laughs> some, some of the, of the uh, uh, phenomenon that we are experiencing today. Uh, the problem of mega disasters, uh, that is also an issue, uh, more concentrated disaster, extreme fires, uh, uh, medicains, and, and so on. Um, and also uh, how the, the development, also uh, some uh, uh, local development is, how some local development is affected by, by this. And of course, at the same time, you always have to couple climate change with uh, anthropogenic uh, impacts. So uh, of course, we are all at work at climate change alone. Uh, uh, you know, it, uh, the impact of climate change alone is, let's say, uh, um, uh, reduced compared to the climate plus anthropogenic impact. Um, First of all, uh, we have uh, just to give you some theoretical framework and some institutional framework. We are in the uh, uh, we are very much in the concept of a resilient a building community resilience for disaster risk management. This is a yoga. This is a called yoga framework for action. That of course is uh, uh, from 2005 2015, by which is a, has been ad updated and. We are continuing in working in, in this concept of building community resilience. Um, but what is resilience? I'm, I'm sure that you all have uh, heard about this concept. Uh, there are many different definitions. I just put some of the ones that I, I like. <laughs> and these are, for example, uh, the capacity to survive, adapt, and recover from a natural disaster. Uh, that is. One, one relevant issue. Another one is the potential of a particular configuration of a system to maintain its structure in the face of disturbance and the ability of the system to reorganize following disturbance driven, driven change. So it's very much uh, related to the capacity of absorbing a shock. Huh? So you, uh, just to give you an example of how uh, the, the shock that is very much related to some events or some uh, disasters or some changes that are, uh, you know, uh, affecting a specific community, a specific, uh, uh, in this case, coastal area. So how the capacity, the capacity of the system, which is also including local communities, to bounce back. So to 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 be able to. Uh, uh, adapt and, and resist to, to this, uh, this shock. And this is, of course, very much related to learning and adaptation. So as you see also from, from, this, uh, from this graph, you have an hazard event uh, and you can have uh, a, a low resilience, so, so low capacity, and there is a gap that, uh, and our objective is, of course, to fill this gap and to increase your resilience. So accelerate the uh, capacity, the speed of recovery from disaster. Uh, disaster, again, can be a, a coastal flood, can be um, a fire, can be uh, an extreme draft, and, and, and so on. So we have a couple of domains that we work uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, let's say, uh, as a result of uh, different domains that are community development, uh, disaster risk management, so that, that our capacity to cope with risk uh, and to adapt to risk and coastal management. So, in, let's say there is a, 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 a quite a, a, a robust and a extended literature, uh, scientific literature on, on this topic, and of course, very much on, on, on coastal zones. Resilience is, the, of course, the result of the, these domains uh, and the, 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 the meat of these, of these three domains. Uh, so how can we uh, improve uh, our uh, resilience, so, so our capacity to, to, to resist and to bounce back? 
of course, <laughs> sorry, there are different elements. Uh, uh, again, we are now focusing to coastal community resilience, but keep in mind that these concepts, of course, can be easily extended also to uh, rural areas, of course, with some, some slight changes, but the, the concept in general, today we, we, we consider that it's more that is worthy to, to focus on, on, on coastal resilience also because I, I, I consider that for some um, uh, didactic reason is also easier uh, to, uh, to, to be uh, integrated as a concept. So we, we have governance overall, uh, socioeconomic and livelihoods, uh, coastal resources management, land use management and structures, risk knowledge, warning and evacuation. There's also, we, we always often uh, uh, speak of um, uh, early warning systems. So the, the system that can uh, warn on uh, specific events that are approaching. Uh, we, last year, we were very much involved in extreme fires, wildfires, mega, also someone called them mega fires. And we uh, found ourselves uh, every, almost everywhere in the Mediterranean, and we found ourselves very much unprepared. Huh? Uh, so we were not really prepared for these mega fires, even if Mediterranean is affected by fires since ages. And emergence and response, so how we organize, uh, and then, of course, disaster recovery, how we, we restart again. Uh, governance is very much about leadership. Leadership is very much about the role of policymakers and uh, um, other uh, local, national and local decision makers to, uh, to lead this process. And I, we believe that wetlands and also Ramsar site managers and protected area has a role to play, a key a role to play in this, in, in the governance sector. And we have tools like the wetland contract, for example, it, which, uh, which is a tool, I don't remember, Flavio, if you already had a chance to, in previous webinars, to this, this uh, I, I guess so, to discuss about governance. But this element of adaptation and disaster risk management should be in, definitely integrated in the world governance process of, of wetlands. Uh, of course, uh, 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 communities and uh, um, diversity also in uh, in terms of uh, uh, sorry I see that my video has gone <laughs> um, so uh, also the capacity of communities to to adapt is very much related with health with is very Dutch sorry with wealth so also how this community as a long term uh, economic, uh, a socioeconomic development plan, and that, uh, of course, it's helping communities to uh, recover after disaster. Coastal uh, resources management, um, and we will come back to this concept later at the end of, the, of this, uh, this session uh, on how, of course, healthy ecosystems are crucial for, for the overall strategy for adaptation. Um, we uh, land use management is also another key for adaptation. So the capacity to plan, the capacity to uh, uh, also to uh, predefine areas that will be um, will be exposed uh, to existing, to current and future uh, uh, risks. And, and of course, land use is, we, is, is a, a relevant part of the vulnerability assessment uh, process. Risk knowledge, uh, this is uh, very much where we will uh, try to, to go in, in more detail, is uh, um, another part that, uh, of course, needs quite a lot of uh, um, scientific background, knowledge, expertise, and and in in, in this work, of course, all the all the uh, stakeholders should be involved, as well as the 
uh, experts at local, national, and also international level if needed, because climate change is an international issue uh, and we never have to forget this. Warning and evacuation, um, we'll see a little bit and also like to have your experience on it and how we, we uh, let's say, inform uh, rapidly uh, the population communities on an uh, uh, coming risk, on a coming hazard. And we have an example here of tsunami, but uh, we know that in, in Mediterranean, we uh, had experienced some tsunami related to earthquake. Uh, it is a long record of tsunami in the Mediterranean, but also if we consider a medicane or a Mediterranean hurricane or uh, simply a storm surge uh, uh, where many properties are affected and many damages will be encountered. So in, in that case, we, we definitely need to consider how to inform, rapidly inform the population and give them the opportunity to also to, to, uh, you know, to save properties or, or, or even lives. Uh, emergency response, it's, it's very much, there, there are at least two, two points. Uh, we, are, we have assisted uh, dramatic floods in all the Maghreb areas recently, uh, during all of last year, but also this year. Uh, we have assisted also some floods, dramatic floods in the desert. <laughs> so that just to say that, that the climate is changing and also we are experiencing uh, facts that uh, are, were definitely uh, sometimes also surprising for, for experts. So uh, how the, 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 the authorities, how the, the, the civil guards are uh, prepared for this and how the population is supported also in terms of, I, I see I put there a picture of a psychologist. Uh, they have a, cru a, re a real role to play uh in in this kind of scenarios so this is also i believe again that wetland managers and the, the wetland community uh, especially where wetlands are also in uh, in critical areas so in areas at risk uh they they can play a role uh, in 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 all senses so which is the coastal resilient uh, cycle um, so how we can, uh, starting from the hazard event, uh, uh, reaching the level of a disaster. Of course, uh, it doesn't mean that an hazard event uh, will take necessarily to a, a disaster. Uh, but this is very much also on how we are able to, starting from the hazard event, to prepare, to be prepared for the uh, uh, the intensity and magnitude of the of the disaster. So of course there is an immediate emergency response, disaster recovery, and then there is a cycle in our capacity to measure and learn from the experience. Huh? So and then plan and then implement solution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a continuous cycle of learning and planning huh? and for for adapting. So this is of course, something that is still my experience, unfortunately, too theoretical. Huh? Even if we have tons of scientific papers and technical reports and plans, sometimes what we see uh, is that this concept is not really implemented at the local level. Huh? So I, I think we really have to, to fight to, to try to, to have this be applied uh, uh, at the local level. So I will just be very quick here because I know that Antonio will give a more complete uh, presentation of hazards and also trends in the in, uh, climate trends in the Med, but I just want to give you also some, uh, some experience, some also personal experience. So uh, Mediterranean Basin is a, a, a triple hotspot, we, we know there is a, about human pressure, uh, of course, climate change, and also biodiversity. By, why biodiversity? Because we are experiencing a dramatic loss of biodiversity. We lost more than 50% of our wetlands since 70s. Huh? Uh, for 
Uh, and this is, of course, uh, something that the, 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 uh, the, the existence of Medwet is exactly to reverse this loss. Huh? So Medwet was created in 91 with the aim to reverse the loss of wetlands in the Mediterranean. So wetlands, loss of wetlands means loss of biodiversity, but you are, <laughs> it's your job. I know that you, you are perfectly aware, but we consider that from our perspective, we really have to work with having these three elements in mind. So just, just to give you, but again, this will better explained by, by Antonio, we uh, are uh, very much under the, the war scenario. Uh, we have quite impressive uh, projections in terms of sea level rise. Why sea level rise? Because sea level rise, it's always a good proxy, a good indicator for other impacts. So if you talk about sea level rise, you are also talking about salt, salt water intrusion. And we know uh, how strong and how impactful is salt water intrusion in the Mediterranean uh, aquifers where there are very much in, of course, all the lagoons and deltas uh, where water is and where, where life is are uh, uh, strongly impacted by, by saltwater intrusion. Existing saltwater intrusion is magnified or is amplified by uh, sea level rise. Also few millimeters, few centimeters of uh, sea level rise have a, a strong impact on, uh, on uh, saltwater intrusion. And of course also salt, uh, sea level rise is uh, amplifying other uh, sea-based forcing like coastal flooding against storm surges, significant waves, extreme waves. So all these, of course, exist, is it, already been exist, but uh, with sea level rise, we know that will have a better, uh, stronger impact. Uh, so just to give you Again, a focus on, I, I was very much impressed also last year, uh, uh, our, uh, the south of Italy, Greece, uh, Tunisia, uh, Libya, ma many other countries, uh, Albania experienced this uh, Medicaid in, in several ways, huh? uh, directly or indirectly, but it was, this was quite impressive, impressive uh, because yes, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, I don't want to 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 uh, give a, a, a you know a, a apocalypse picture because this is not the case. We have to 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 be clear. But at the same time, I, my my personal I, I, you know ex exchange with with expert meteorologists and. Um, and I really try to understand, but what is really, what we are really talking about? I mean, is something that we really have to scare. Are we going to see more hurricanes in the Mediterranean or not? So I see there is still uh, a lot to, to discover, a lot to, to model, but these things are happening. So that means uh, that we have uh, winds above, one uh, 35 kilometers per hour. This is a medicine. Huh? We consider a medicine uh, when when the the the, the winds are, are are reaching this speed. Uh, when this happen, it this happen when the uh, sea surface uh, temperature is around 26 degrees. And if you measure and if you measure the sea surface temperature in the Mediterranean in the last decades you will see how this has improved, has improved more than any other sea in the world. Huh? So uh, we are not, we don't have to be surprised it is, uh, it is a medicaid or this, let's say extreme uh, uh, events are happening uh, because this is due to extreme temperatures. Uh, but how these are formed, how this happen. Um, so they very much work like tropical hurricanes. So is an excess of thermal energy that is accumulated above the sea. And this energy is rapidly transformed into kinetic energy uh, that of course uh, 
uh, is releasing excess energy to form a convergence area in lower layers, which uh, determines a upward motion and a small uh, ground depression. So uh, without entering into many uh, details, this is of course triggered by, again, by uh, the temperature of the sea. Mm -hmm. Uh, because sometimes it's, it's difficult to, uh, I, I, I could not um, take to you today um, another example that we are studying about the, the mega fires that we had the last summer that are, were also triggered by, by temperature and that experts are definitely recognized as climate extreme events. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of a medican in 2020, huh? you see in the Union Sea. Um, uh, this is also my, my personal experience of a, a, a cyclone uh, passing through Cagliari, uh, not a medican. Um, and just this, uh, without being a medicain, uh, and without mentioning the last year event in Catania or in, uh, in Sicily, uh, uh, this just the city was literally blown up. Huh? Uh, uh, we were completely unprepared. Huh? Uh, and always uh, the, the authorities, also the press, also we, we talk about extraordinary events it's a way to say okay this is extraordinary so we don't need to be prepared for this huh? so this happened huh? no i mean this will happen and re-happen again so uh the, 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 we can make a difference we say we can consider this will happen and we have to, and this is very much our work not the work of medwet but the work of those that are involved in, in uh, concrete adaptation and disaster risk management is to integrate preparedness and awareness in the, in the uh, 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 real life of, of a city. So urban planning, et cetera, and, and any kind of, of management. So this is a, a picture from my balcony. <laughs> so you see that that was also quite, quite impressive. And these are also the, the rain concentration uh, of, of the area. Uh, as you see, um, so all these, I'm, I'm not saying that was fully predictable, but uh, we add elements to, to better prepare the population to avoid uh, 10, uh, um, 10 and 10 million euro of damages that were very much related to our La the lack of capacity of authorities to, to prepare. And this is, of course, just an example, but we know that this is experienced by all of you uh, everywhere in, in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so the question is uh, how we uh, assess. I don't know if there are questions. Um, maybe yes. Uh, no, I'm just checking. OK. Sorry, but if you want to to start to stop me, please don't don't hesitate. I just anyway want to to finish and let let, let the more room for for questions. So one of the issues that, that this is very much part of my work as a researcher is how we assess coastal risks. So how we can predict, how we can try to understand or to to uh, where where coastal risk will happen. I will start from a very simple, but I consider effective diagram that was proposed in by IPCC in 2014. That is the, the concept of risk itself. Uh, so risk is a combination of, is a result of vulnerability, hazards and exposure. And hazards both related to climate and non-climate. Uh, forcing. So uh, of course, in climate, we also have natural uh, variability. And of course, we have anthropogenic, uh, the anthropogenic component. Then vulnerability that is also uh, in larger part related to socioeconomic processes. Um, 
and then of course exposure so what what is at stake so what which is the asset that is at risk population properties ecosystems etc so we'll see that uh, combining this element we arrive to uh, define risk uh, this is another nice uh, figure on uh, coastal risk. Uh, so again, we have climate here, natural variability, anthropogenic climate change. We have drivers. Drivers are development, uh, uh, for example, but uh, if we talk about climate related drivers, we have sea level rise, again, storms, extreme sea level, temperature, CO2 concentration. So we also have here ocean acidification and Mediterranean, like other, it's, we know, we call it the uh, little ocean, um, still is, a lead, is an ocean. Uh, and we are also experiencing a dramatic acidification in the Mediterranean. And then risk as a result of exposure and vulnerability and drivers. That means, uh, on human systems and on natural systems. So settlements, infrastructure, services, ecosystem services like food production, tourism, health. And then of course, all kind of, also in terms of landform, rocky coasts, beaches, wetland and sea grasses, coral reefs, aquifer, estuaries and lagoons, delta, et cetera, et cetera. So adaptation is of course, uh, can both work and should actually work both on exposure. So in reducing exposure, reducing vulnerability, and at the same time, trying to mitigate drivers, uh, so trying to uh, reduce the impact of drivers. Um, Without entering again into many details, risk can be considered as a function of a hazard, vulnerability, and exposure. One, uh, one function that we find very much in the scientific literature is hazard per vulnerability per exposure. That means that if it's not vulnerable, risk is zero. If hazard is, there is no hazard, risk is zero. If there is no exposure, risk is zero. So this is maybe easy to understand that risk is a, a concept. It's, it's not a, a, you know, a, a material thing. It's not, it's, it's, it's a, it exists as a concept to understand how hazard vulnerability and exposure are um, uh, interrelated. So without hazard, if we don't have sea level rise, if we don't have uh, uh, a medicaid if we don't have uh, drafts of course we don't have risk uh, if population is not vulnerable at all for that risk for that hazard we don't have risk if the, we don't have population ecosystem or nothing in that place there is no risk there is no population no risk so this is it should help to you know to also understand that the concept of risk is quite uh, functional to, to define a, a very much focus in, in defining that specific condition in that specific place. So we used to uh, discuss about coastal hazards, coastal vulnerability and coastal exposure. So how we can measure these, these components. Just to give you a quick and few, uh, few and quick definitions, hazard uh, the potential occurrence of a natural or human-induced physical event or trend or physical impact that may cause loss of life, injury, or other health impacts, as well as damage and loss to property, infrastructure, livelihoods, service provision, ecosystems, environmental resources, but as such, we refer to climate-related physical events or trends for their, or their physical impact. Huh? So we, we, we like to measure, <laughs> we like to well-define as ours. So what is vulnerability? Uh, vulnerability is the propensity or the predisposition to be adversely affected by hazards. Huh? 
vulnerability encompasses a variety of concepts and elements, including sensitivity or susceptibility to arm and lack of capacity to cope and adapt. So we have some, uh, somehow the, the, the characteristics of, a, for example, a cost specific coastal area, so in terms of landform, geomorphology, et cetera, et cetera, but also the lack of capacity of the population of the, the, the ecosystem to adapt to the hazard. Huh? So vulnerability, it's definitely a very complex concept. Uh, there are, again, tons of papers, scientific papers, definitions, etc. cetera, but uh, it's, it, and sometimes we, we use the concept of vulnerability, not always in the right term or on the right meaning, but yeah, you have, definitely have to, to cope with this term. You will always find in, in all your, uh, uh, in your work. So exposure, for exposure, we are, we, again, we can consider population, coastal communities, we can consider infrastructure, economic systems, or also uh, ecosystems. Huh? We uh, develop, uh, we did a research, a specific research for the southern coast of France, uh, in which we uh, focus on um, we focus on uh, um, uh, ecosystems uh, like uh, Posidonia seagrass, dune ecosystems, and uh, and other uh, and other ecosystems. So how these were affected by by I don't know why. Sorry, but the the webcam is not working anymore. <laughs> I'm just uh, trying to. So it's better now. Okay. I go click just this to give an example of some variables, indicators to define coastal hazards, vulnerability, and exposure. Huh? So we often define coastal exposure through land, land cover, land use. So this is one of the first maps that has been produced in, in one, one of the researches in which I was involved uh, to define where the climate forcing is, uh, where the, which part of the Mediterranean coastal zones uh, is affected by coastal forcing, uh, trying to define also some level of magnitude. Uh, as you see in red, we uh, describe the extremely high forcing. Uh, that is a combination of several forcing, uh, in particular sea-based forcing like sea level rise, storms, um, etc., and extremely low. You see all uh, quite a relevant part of the southern east coast, uh, so all Egypt, Libya but also Middle East and also part of the Turkish coast is uh, considered an extremely high. We know that the Nile Delta is, uh, is one of these hotspots. This is, of course, confirmed. And as a sensitivity analysis of this study, we try to exchange with the experts on the ground, with local experts, and we definitely had to uh, likely <laughs> uh, not to do many adjustments. So because local data were also confirming this, uh, um, this, uh, this study. And uh, this is a coastal vulnerability map. So in here, you, there will be before we see how impact, uh, so how hazard, how climate is affecting the Mediterranean. And here, how the coastal communities are prepared, how vulnerable to, to those forcing. Huh? So again, we see, you can see easily that the red parts are those parts that are not, that are quite extremely highly vulnerable. Why? Because of um, uh, concentration of population, huh? Uh, where you have more population 
concentrated, so lack of uh, also um, infrastructures for uh, coping with and adapting to climate change, landforms. Uh, the, uh, what is extremely vulnerable is a landform, a low-lying coastal areas. So the areas that are, of course, under the level of the sea, and this is uh, typical of Delta. You see the Venice Lagoon, for example, uh, or other spots in Spain and France. So there is a combination of factors, but this is also related the capacity of the population that is measured through education, uh, uh, preparation to, uh, and also knowledge of this, uh, this topic, age of the population. So all uh, uh, distribution. And so there are many, many indicators that are producing this, this map. Uh, coastal exposure is, is again, related to uh, the density of the population uh, and also to the, to the land use, so which are the assets that have value. For example, there are economical activities that are uh, relevant for that specific area in terms of also of added value produced. So those areas are red. Uh, you have high density of population and a high economic value produced by that area. So that means that if you lose these areas, you are losing not only, of course, properties, lives, but also economic, uh, uh, economic GDP. And then we have here the, the, the result of the study and for the definition of risk. And you see here the result of this, uh, uh, this work. Uh, that identify a number of hotspots, uh, so areas in which risk is high, uh, and you are almost have hotspots everywhere in the in the map. Uh, you will see that not per hazard, and it's not by chance that these hotspots are uh, very much concentrated in areas that are uh, low-lying coastal areas that have deltas, which you have, uh, of course, concentration of population, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, was quite obvious sometime, but we also found resu results that were not so obvious. But if you are, uh, there is also a focus at Zoom uh, on, on, on countries. So if you are interested, of course, in having more information, I'll, I will be more than happy to, to share it with you. And there is also another work that was carried out by Metsi Foundation with Bad Life on defining, uh, um, uh, let's say, the uh, hotspots, uh, also in terms of presence of wetlands and now wetlands could support for adaptation. Um, so I am running late. I would just go quick to adaptation options and, and then the role of wetlands. Huh? Uh, these are the four uh, key uh, or let's say more popular uh, adaptation strategies that are suggested and uh, recommended at the, at the level of a coastal, coastal zone. And this is starting from avoid. So that means just uh, displace uh, uh, houses, for example, uh, or infrastructure to avoid directly the risk. To protect is to create any kind of barrier that is, uh, let's say, preventing from sea level rise or storms or waves. Accommodate, uh, that we will see in Louisiana <laughs> last week, how this was quite useless because all the houses were, the, even if in, built in this way, were totally destroyed by the sea. And then uh, retreat, once again, is uh, to relocate or abandon sometime those areas that are, that are a risk. But avoid, is, it's interesting because this is very much related to planning. Huh? So, uh, this, uh, this is definitely my preferred option. If you, uh, if you plan properly your coastal zones, you just have, and with good information on, on coastal risk, you just avoid 
to build uh, houses in this point. Huh? And you will maybe bring, in this case, the house is already built, you just retreat. So wetland-based solution, I'm not going back to, to the data of, of wetland, you are well informed. This is the wetland, Mediterranean wetland outlook. You can find in our website, in the website of the Tour du Valais. And you will find a lot of information, also interesting information about wetlands and climate change. Um, um, I, I guess this is also will be a topic that will be addressed by, by Antonio. Uh, so uh, just a few numbers, 90% of natural disasters are linked to water. Their frequency has doubled over the last 30 years. In Europe, floods cost 5 billion, hmm, 2000, 2012. Uh, and this cost will be multiplied by four in 2050. So this is already give you a, 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 a concrete idea of the kind of investment that, I mean, also that should be considered to, to avoid this cost. Uh, Nature-based solutions are, I, I don't know if you are familiar with this concept, but uh, nature-based solutions are one of the, let's say, definitely our uh, preferred solution, huh? because uh, our uh, uh, nature-based solutions uh, very much rely on the capacity of natural system with our help to uh, uh, give concrete alternatives to, to adapt to changes. Um, and among these solutions, we have uh, wetlands. Huh? Uh, but just let me give a, de a definition from IUCN. Nature-based solutions are actions to protect, to sustainably manage and restore natural and modify ecosystems in ways that address societal societal challenges effectively and adaptively to provide both human well-being and biodiversity benefits. So as you see, is uh, when we come to wetlands is the way we uh, manage, we restore, we protect our wetlands to uh, uh, address, uh, in this case, climate, uh, climate effects. This is an, an example. These are some example of nature-based solution, preserve and restore wetlands, use wetlands in cities, uh, develop flood expansion zones instead of building in those areas and restore riparian forests. So these are interesting and, and, and very nice uh, nature-based solution. I will conclude just giving you the case of Camargue, uh, uh, which is a, a very relevant one, uh, with a restoration of 6,500 uh, hectares of former salinas treated, treated by coastal erosion. So uh, actually, um, this is, was a very challenging project uh, with many, many uh, actors were involved on uh, uh, that started, of course, from uh, the uh, the knowledge of how the coastal uh, how coastal erosion was affecting this coast. Um, the idea basically was to, uh, you know, also the system Salinas is very much related to a number of dikes uh, at dams here. So the idea was simply, but not so simply, <laughs> abandoning front dikes. So just renouncing some of these artificial dikes and to reinforce inland dikes and to allow hydrological and biological reconnection. So uh, which were the results? Which are the results that actually we are still measuring? Effective dissipation of wave energy during storm, creation of new sandy shore, working as barrier, natural barrier to, to storms and sea level rise, and important increase, uh, last but not least, important increase in biodiversity value. So you see here some pictures, so new sand. And so this system was really reconstructed from true nature, huh? just 
uh, breaching and breaking this, creating breaches and breaking this, uh, the front, the so-called front, front dike. Uh, this is really the very far uh, last uh, uh, slide. Uh, so which is, which are the benefits of wetland restoration? We will have more and more webinars on this topic. We will also have a, a new conference uh, on this topic, uh, maybe in October. We had one in last year. Uh, we, we really believe that wetland restoration is the priority. Huh? Is also the priority to uh, address climate climate change. Huh? Um, we uh, this is just an, an interesting number: 63 million euro as a val value of state public funds uh, to restore ecosystem services. So this is you know these are numbers. The numbers that we also. Uh, use a lot when we, we deal with, with uh, the public decision makers. We have here six example, five examples, sorry, in Albufeira, Spain, Venice, uh, Konya, Turkey, Tyre in Lebanon, and in Camargue uh, on how restoration has been already carried out successfully, how this is producing results, how this is producing ecosystem services, and as Medwet, our aim also for the next decade is to invest as much energy as we can for, uh, for restoration of wetlands and also to support you in planning restoration and fundraising and uh, raising funds for restoration. So I think I, Flavio, I, I Yes. complete my presentation sorry for running five minutes late oh no we start later so thank yeah. you for this very interesting and detailed talk which gave, gave us an overview of the team with particular focus on wetlands including clear examples uh i think alessio you have a question on the chat uh from mr abdeslam Bulchafra. can you access the, the chat room to see the question euh, les modules de prévention des risques en lien avec les facteurs anthropiques qui peuvent à court moyen terme à des vérités. Euh, alors, je, je réponds euh, en, en français à Abdeslam euh, où il, est, il, existe, il existe plus que des, des modules euh, de prévention tout court. Il existe des de, de protocoles, hein, euh, des protocoles de prévention euh, et qui sont beaucoup basés sur la formation, euh, aussi sur la mise en place de systèmes euh, d'alerte, euh, systèmes de, de vraiment de, euh, de preparedness, hein, de, de préparation de la population locale et des autorités locales à, euh, à, à, à comment, comment dire, à se préparer aux risques. Mais ça demande, ça d'abord, les connaître, ces risques. Hein. Et la question aujourd'hui, et on est encore dans une phase de connaissance, des besoins de connaissances de, de risques. Et, et seulement quand on aura une bonne connaissance, là où on a une bonne connaissance, on commence effectivement à voir que ces systèmes d'adaptation, de, 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 de modules, de, 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 comme vous avez défini, de prévention, sont bien, commencent à être mis en place. Et la connaissance vraiment est à la base, à la base de tout. Thank you, thank you, Alessio. Is there any other question for Alessio? Don't be shy. <laughs> I see maybe there is a hand, Randa. No, oh, no, sorry, that was my. Okay, no. Uh, if not, I would just have a very short comment or reflection to, to propose Alessio for mm -hmm. everyone. Uh, I know that one exi exciting route to lowering, for example, emission is the blue carbon, the organic carbon that coastal wetlands, uh, for example, mangroves, tidal marsh and seagrass can store. And for this, they are collectively known as blue carbon ecosystems. But uh, could you tell us more about the role of wetlands in this sense? And what are probably the future developments uh, in relation to nature based solution opportunities? If there is any virtual example uh, in this sense uh, to cite? Yeah, uh, uh, I, I, first let me say, Flavio, that 
uh, wetlands, in particular peatlands, uh, uh, but also coastal wetlands. And we, when we say coastal wetlands, we say also salt marshes, uh, mangroves, seagrass meadows. So all these are uh, unique uh, carbon sink. Uh, uh, if we consider just wetlands, for example, they can stock like 2000 tons hmm, of carbon, organic carbon uh, per hectare. That is huge. And it is huge in is almost 10 times more than tropical forests, uh, just, just to give an example. And it's 2000 for, for peatlands, but it's not less than 400,000 for uh, coastal wetlands, uh, like uh, uh, seagrass meadows, for example, and we know the, the role of seagrass meadows also for producing oxygen in, in the Mediterranean. But there are two things. Uh, and, and then oh, this is just the carbon that is stocked, uh, the, the famous carbon pools. If we consider the sequestration capacity, so how these um, ecosystems sequestrate and fix carbon per year, we also have among the highest level of sequestration rate. Peatlands are around 200 gram per square meter, when seagrass is 150 grams per square meter. That is huge. Again, more than tropical forests or any other, uh, other system. Also, mangroves are relevant. Mangroves are 250 gram per square meter. But there is uh, uh, an if. <laughs> uh, first, uh, uh, this reminds us how we cannot, we cannot for any, by any chance lose these this systems. Uh? We cannot lose peatlands. We cannot lose grasses because each time we do this, we are re, uh, putting this carbon in the atmosphere. So we are accelerating uh, uh, green, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, reaccelerating uh, uh, carbon emissions. And on the other side, we also have to consider that this capacity is due to the fact that the most of the system work in anaerobic conditions. Huh? So we don't have uh, we don't have to forget this. So anaerobic conditions are creating. Uh, they say the perfect environment uh, for uh, absorbing carbon. Huh? So uh, coastal wetlands, peatlands are uh, super systems for, for climate mitigation and restoration and conservation of the system is much more than just uh, providing, uh, let's say system for uh, biodiversity. So they have a, a crucial role and whenever we do restoration, whenever we also have to consider that our daily work of protecting and your work of protecting and conserving this area is much more worthy than just uh, that is already incredibly relevant to protect biodiversity and migratory species, but they are also contributing concretely in keeping the climate uh, regulate the cli under control and regulate uh, the climate. Great, excellent, Alessio. Thank you. Uh, I see also that in the chat, Yaila asks, how is possible to uh, recognize this kind of risk? I think uh, to anticipate Oi. some of the protective measures. Oi. And then there is also Mr. Uh, Mohamed, Mohamed uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, would uh, like to ask a question. <coughs> uh, oui, but comme je essayé d'expliquer, effectivement, les risques uh, sont une euh, une fonction, son fonction de différents facteurs euh, et ce, surtout la connaissance des procès climatiques, euh, des hasards, des dangers qui sont créés par les procès climatiques combinés avec les procès euh, anthropiques, donc humains, euh, la connaissance de la structure de, de, du système, si on est sur des zones côtières, si on est des zones côtières, si on est des zones rurales, des de, 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 Alpes, on, on, on doit connaître bien comme les, les, les forçages climatiques impactent ces systèmes. Hein? Donc, on doit connaître comme l'interaction, la réponse aux euh, forçages climatiques. Et de l'autre côté, 
pour connaître les risques, il faut savoir qu'est-ce qu'on cherche. Hein. Si euh, notre objectif, c'est euh, surtout euh, la population, euh, bien sûr, euh, notre système doit euh, évaluer euh, exactement, et surtout si on est à connaissance des risques qui mettent en danger la vie des personnes, mettent en danger les, les propriétés, mais aussi certains écosystèmes, on doit mettre tout ça dans notre modèle d'évaluation et, et on va connaître exactement comment un forçage, comment un impact spécifique va affecter les personnes qui habitent dans ces zones spécifiques. Donc, on, on, on a la capacité de faire ça, ça demande un peu de temps, ça demande des données, ça demande souvent des questionnaires. Hein. On, a souvent, euh, on est en train aujourd'hui de faire une étude à Maroc avec, euh, sous la Côte des Tétouin, euh, sur euh, comment le, le changement climatique affecte le, la population, surtout la population plus vulnérable, donc les femmes, les enfants. Et tout. Donc, c'est quelque chose qui, là, demande par contre des questionnaires, comme, demande de comprendre comment la, les familles, comment les, les structures de la population est structurée euh, et, et, et organisée et pour comprendre effectivement comment des changements peuvent affecter leur vie quotidienne. Mohamed euh, Tout d'abord, je remercie Medouet pour l'invitation à ce webinaire et je remercie euh, Dr Alessio pour sa conférence très instructive et surtout pour les cartes qu'il a présentées concernant la vulnérabilité des côtes. Euh, vous avez évoqué euh, parmi les, les conséquences des changements climatiques l'élévation du niveau de la mer et l'intrusion des eaux salines dans les zones humides et dans les rivières. Nous vivons effectivement ce phénomène d'intrusion des eaux salines, des eaux qui proviennent de la mer, au niveau de, du bassin, au niveau de la zone humide de l'embouchure de la Moulouia au Maroc. Et nous avons même perdu des terres, les riverains, à côté de la zone humide, à cause de cette intrusion. On a perdu des sols à cause de la salinité. Mais euh, euh, on a constaté que c'était euh, euh, plus exactement la conséquence des débits qu'apportait qu la Moulouia. Il y a euh, une baisse des débits, il y a une convoitise dans l'utilisation des eaux de, de la Moulouia. Et donc, le débit, avec le temps, il a, il a, il, il a diminué à cause de la surexploitation, à cause des pompages. Et ce qui est pire... Maintenant, euh, les autorités ils prévoient la construction d'un autre barrage. On a du dernier barrage qui existe, qui est Mishra Hamadi, et on veut faire un autre barrage au niveau de Sfsaf. Mishra Sfsaf, entre Mishra Sfsaf et le barrage euh, Mishra Hamadi, c'est là où il y a les sources qui alimentent euh, la, la dernière partie de la Moulouia, et on veut donc priver carrément la Moulouia de son débit écologique, et c'est une grande... Euh, c'est un risque, c'est une catastrophe qui va survenir à Lemouria. Nous avons essayé donc de attirer l'attention des instances internationales, Ramsar, l'Alliance méditerranéenne pour les zones humides, au niveau national aussi, nous avons essayé d'attirer l'attention des décideurs pour justement essayer de, 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 de voir les conséquences de, de, de ces aménagements sur la Moulouia. Et maintenant, c'est vraiment très, très grave cette intrusion de, de, de la mer, cette intrusion des eaux salines qui va vraiment euh, provoquer des catastrophes au niveau de la zone humide. Et merci pour la conférence. Oui, merci Mohamed. Vous avez touché un argument euh, très, très important qui est euh, comment partager à toute la Méditerranée. Effectivement, il y a toujours, d'un côté, on fait des barrages pour... Euh, l'eau, pour avoir de l'eau, pour euh, arroser des terrains, etc. De l'autre côté, à cause de ça, euh, on réduit les débits et on permet effectivement à l'eau de la mer de pénétrer de plus en plus et, qui, et, et ça, ça va brûler la, la fertilité des, ter des terrains agricoles euh, sur les zones côtières. Ça, c'est le paradoxe total euh, qu'on a vu malheureusement dans les derniers 30-40 ans. Euh, arrivé partout en Méditerranée, il n'y a pas un pays de la Méditerranée qui s'est en sortie. Hein. C'est pour dire comme c'est, euh, il y a un demande d'eau, donc il y a de moins en moins d'eau, donc de plus en plus de barrages, mais ces barrages malheureusement. Donc il y a un aspect à mon avis très économique. Hein. 
Il faut arriver à, euh, nous, on, bien sûr, on est en contact avec les autorités marocaines, on les sollicite, mais il y a peut-être vraiment la nécessité de faire des études économiques et comprendre, faire une estimation. Voilà, si vous continuez si, à réduire les débits, le terrain, la, la, la vitesse de l'intrusion saline, ça va affecter 100 hectares, 1000 hectares de terrain agricole, la perte économique est ça. L'avantage la, économique de ça, donc il faut mettre ça sur, euh, sans considérer la biodiversité, parce qu'après il y a aussi la biodiversité, mais déjà avoir la capacité à mesurer le, 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 le dégât économique, parce qu'on n'y pense pas souvent, hein. on n'y pense pas pratiquement jamais. <rire> et, et donc la, la, on, on se concentre et nous aussi parfois on n'a pas la capacité de mesurer, on a, on a la capacité de plus en plus, il y a des des systèmes de, de, de modèles de valuation économique très intéressantes. Qui, il y a un modèle qui, 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 a, qui a mis en place aussi BirdLife, qui permet d'évaluer les systèmes écosystémiques écosystémique qui sont perdus. Donc, voilà, il y a, il y a des choses qui, qui nous permettent aujourd'hui de dire, OK, voilà, on, on sait, vous le faites pour cette raison, mais sachez que la, la perte de, euh, économique concrète totale pour les Maroc est peut-être plus élevé que euh, c'est là que vous pensez de récupérer. Donc, il y a vraiment de, de nouveaux outils qui, qui, pour essayer de, de, de donner des réponses ou de stimuler la, la, les décisions publiques. Merci pour votre réponse. Thank you, Alessio. Thank you, Mohamed, for, for this change. Uh, I would like to say that we can now stop for a while, just for a, a brief coffee break. Yeah, I don't we know can if maybe have something else yeah. to add before the, the, the break. The ocean. So the seas actually have helped a lot the system, the, the, the global climate system to absorb some of these increases in temperature because water itself, it's, it's dissolving CO2, first of all, which is an important effort, in containing concentration of greenhouse gases, but it's also dissolving heat itself and disturbing a lower temperature. So it has a, had a mitigating effect and is still having a mitigating effect, which will not be undefinite. This is also something very important. We have the water, the coast, the sea have also had an important service in mitigation. And uh, we have to be glad to that. But unfortunately, like, Some of this role has been working mostly in the 90s, really. There was a good buffering of, uh, on, uh, on extreme temperature from the oceans. But lately, we've seen that the system has been growing in terms of warming much faster in the last years. And, uh, and, and we have witnessed really like one year after the other. And this is especially what we've seen in the Mediterranean, which is a hotspot, like Alessio said, it's an important hotspot of climate change, but the last years have been extremely dramatically warmer and warmer. Uh, this, this, this is something that we're witnessing now, clearly. Uh, and, 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 and this is something that clearly, like we can put in context of, uh, uh, In, in implying like what is identification causes related as clearly and strongly linked to, to, to greenhouse emissions, something that has happened in, at an industrial area, like uh, in, the, in, in the 150 years uh, with increasing very strong rates, but let's not, rem let's not forget that it's also the increases of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere depends also on land use change. So the emission of carbon sequestered and stock in land use systems like peatland and wetlands that were mentioned before by Alessio, that strong related part. But what's important is these changes have all happened like for thousands of years in the Mediterranean system. So the Mediterranean system has been always seen these dramatic changes which were also led by strong land use changes, because already 2000 years ago, most of the Mediterranean areas was converted to agriculture. And that had some implications already in the systems. 
Antonio, uh, uh, really sorry to interrupt you. Uh, apparently, there is some bad sound for some of the audience and for the, the translator as well. Uh, probably, can you uh, get to lost the microphone or speak slower? No, just to or to move the microphone or just to to I don't know if there is something on the settings. I can hear you quite well, uh, but apparently it's not the same for all the others, uh, neither for the translators. Uh, the translator uh, suggests to use the headset or use a microphone. Or... Well, I'll use the microphone. The, the, I, I'll get closer to the microphone if you don't mind, and I will speak closer to the microphone and try to be a little bit spacing out my words like this. Tell me if I speak like this, if they're okay, and I'm really sorry for the inconvenience. Vera, okay, could you confirm? Because I have no problems to intend uh, Antonio, to, to hear Antonio, but please, Vera, um, I'll, confirm that everything is fine. I will try to, one more, two more slides. Tell me if you still have problems. Okay. Okay, um, Vera said that she will try to, to take sorry. over the translation. No, no. Sorry, sorry. Um, okay, seems to be okay. That, um, try again, Antonio, and uh, try to go ahead. Sorry. Okay, to... so I will keep going. The recent warning detected uh, from monitoring of weather and uh, global studies uh, have really shown in the last IPCC assessment uh, how marked how it has become, and it has become especially over landform. Something that I was mentioning before, like landform are picking up the strongest uh, sign, and especially landforms are more abundant in the northern hemisphere. So that is really a clear sign like where we see the strongest uh, effect of and changes of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a global warming. But as we are mentioning some average increases of temperature, and that is something that uh, becomes uh, really uh, comes, that becomes really a number itself. We have to understand that really what is the effect of uh, this warming. It's the it's sort of, of accelerating circulations. It's accelerating Et la circulation, la sensibility des systems, and donc. Ce qui se passe est que cette vitesse plus rapide a rendu le système plus extrême et moins facile à euh, prévoir. Et donc, and those are explicit, especially events which create the, the biggest impact. So global warming is a number. We are already getting to 1.5 degrees above. But what this means, it's really, really, really too much stronger and much more dangerous extreme event in terms of like of big heat waves or strong precipitations. And especially of uh, the macro system of the Mediterranean. This is like a, a representation of a typical uh, uh, meteorological forcing around the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, it's really on the edge of uh, diff and a crossroad of different climate patterns. So we still have a control in the winter from an Arctic oscillation in the north and the North Atlantic high and low pressure. And this sort of like gives an influence of the winter time, which is more marked, while we have from the south, from the tropics or the tropical area, we have streams of air and sometimes humidity compared with air pushing north and sort of stabilizing the climate in the summer. 
Now, with the system becoming more excited in this climate pattern, we still have the, between winter and summer, we have narrow, more narrow space for those spring and uh, fall seasons, which are extremely important also to regenerate sustainable freshwater resources. So this is something important. It's the overall Mediterranean climate that has become a hot spot because it's really more sensitive to the effect of different pattern systems. So as I mentioned, the, 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 the changes in annual mean temperature are really clear, are, are, are stronger more like than the average changes observed globally. Still, that is one reason why we're talking about hotspot in the Mediterranean. But the other important things is that there are even more importantly and more dramatically extreme events which are causing like heat waves, especially which are doubling in persistence over like land in summertime, but also prolonged drought, for instance, which is, which is, we can have an high variability where we can have strong drought uh, for other years also, and then all together, then having like periods with heavy rainfall events. Uh, and, and this is heavy rainfall events, this is something that I like also Alessio touching it out because the medical cyclones are becoming an important uh, and very relevant factor for variability in the, in, in, in the Mediterranean areas. We definitely, just once follow up of what Alessio was mentioning, we definitely don't know yet for sure, like on the medicaid's development in the future. Unfortunately, we are just discovering what medicaid's uh, cyclones are. Uh, the truth is that we have highest uh, observation, better observation system from satellites with higher resolution now than we did not have 20, 30 years ago. So with this satellite images and with this high technology we have now, we can clearly recognize medicaids. We can see the eye of the medicaid in the center. While 20 years ago, we could see clouds at 300 kilometer resolution. So we cannot even see exactly how the systems were forming. It's probably true that we had some very strong events and probably were associated with some sort of medicaids. But now it's clear that we have attention, we are more vulnerable to the systems because we have a lot of population on the coast. So these medicaids are absorbing a lot of interest now in the climate community. And I'm sure like there is gonna be a lot to talk about this. Now, uh, what, what, what you mentioned about changes that have been observed is really that if we talk about, for instance, Europe, and this is a map for Europe, sorry, but it really simplifies the system. We have a light, higher latitude, like Northern Europe, uh, on average, an increase in precipitation, while in the Mediterranean, in average, there is a decrease in precipitation. This is always something that precipitations, uh, it's, it's, it's hard, it's difficult to assess because there is a lot of spatial variability in precipitation events, but in general, we can see that the, the events are not uh, really, uh, the, 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 the recharge of precipitation is really pushed up much more north than throughout the Mediterranean as it used to be. Also, oceans, this is something that uh, was mentioned in, from Alessio, and thank you again, Oceans are, are, are having an important uh, factor here because they absorb a lot of heat. And it's important to understand that the sea rise, it's not just driven by snow melt or melt of ice and glaciers, but also that by heat itself, because as water is becoming warmer, is actually expanding. So that is also an effect of temperature that has directly on water. So there, there is a, an also an important effect. And it's not just sea rise that it's uh, on average becoming more consistent, but slowly, but it's increasing steadily, a little by little every year. 
but it's also the fact that there are going to be an increase in pattern of height of sea waves, so storms. Sea storms are going to be definitely more marked. Uh, tell me, are you hearing me okay, Flavio? Can you give me a feedback? Sorry for uh, if I'm not. Yeah, yes, everything is clear, and uh, we okay. can hear you both in English and in French now. Okay, thanks a lot. I will skip this because <laughs> Alessio did a great job here on talking about coastal erosion. What I want to mention here, this is something an advocacy that I, I, I it's something that I want to really highlight is that how in the causes of climate change uh, force from greenhouse gas emission, there is really substantial evidence for that. Uh, these are mostly produced by greenhouse gas emission from industrial, from agriculture activity, especially also fertilization. So there is all this activity, produ production activity that really implies the biggest amount of, of emissions, but also land use change. And this is something that has happened and we know in the, in the, in, in the Mediterranean for, for already a long time before the industrial area. So these are two important anthropic activities. Other activities have been, uh, have been observed, obviously, of course, causing climate changes over time. And, uh, and especially there have been some like slow uh, changes in the sense that there have been some changes, for instance, in the orbit of Earth and in its distance and inclination with the sun in the way it receives radiation, or also of movement of tectonic plaque. These are very uh, slow movements. Uh, and there have been other, also other reasons to be volcanic eruptions. Volcanic eruptions also creates uh, a, a, a cloud, usually the sort of like shade uh, from radiation coming into the surface. And they can create some strong effect over a few years. But having said that, all of these natural activities, which were also in part advocated by possible causes of climate change, they are not really anything that the system that, that, that the system can, can be justified in what we are seeing right now. We are not seeing something uh, over a few years. Now it's about and strong, we're about 70 years that we are seeing these changes. It's very clear that it's linked to greenhouse gas emissions. There is, a, there is a huge important understanding that we have a mission here that we can resolve somehow or mitigate the effect of this emission because they're extremely important the effects they can have on this society. Uh, the main sources of emissions are the energy sector, agriculture, foster and other units, and industry. Altogether, these are all uh, sectors which can foresee good measures for uh, reducing emission, to be more efficient in terms of energy use, in terms of uh, also then greenhouse gas emission. Uh, I want to say this because it's, it's, it, it, there has been an increase in strong debate. There has been a strong community around in the intergovernmental panel on climate change that really has made available reports in several languages, starting from the 90, every five, six years is made available different report where all the information is condensed. And it's a, a lot, it's a great source of information there has been now the last reports have become available just last year for the climate change and, and this is the sixth report and up to a few months rapport et, et ensuite on a le rapport sur la télévision des changements climatiques et sur l'adaptation aux vulnérabilités je vous invite à, à lire ces in many different languages they are really an excellent source of information, very detailed with information also for policy reporting, for summaries. So you can, I'm really sure you can find a lot of more information on this. But the debate, it's still really ongoing and it's still really important. 
this debate because we have to understand that now we are living a situation where all this, we, 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 for instance, these days we're seeing other risk, very risk about and uh, about the wars maybe, but we, we have to understand that climate risks are the basis, are the one that are, uh, are in, interconnected to other risk altogether, to water resources availability, to food security. And that at the end really enforce tensions, really make tensions stronger for food security and water security especially. So it's always important to keep the process going, although there are other unfortunate priorities now ahead of us. The, the risk for the future in the projected changes are really following up most of what we seen also from the past. It's really, he um, it, it, it will have a stronger pace depend or not on our effort to mitigate emissions. So we are talking about scenarios of less, more or less uh, lower or stronger global warming. But in general, what really is happening and will happen strongly in the Mediterranean, it's increasing temperature, especially in the summer. So, uh, it, it, so this is something that we it will lead for sure to like strongest heat waves and drought and more reliance on water resources. On the other side, we also see uh, what the effect in precipitation is, is that we will see uh, a decrease both in winter and in summer. And probably, this is still not clear yet, but it's associated, there will be a slight increase of extreme rainfall events during fall time. And this is also due to, fat, to events like medicaid. So altogether, we see a stronger change in some seasonality in precipitation. So we, we will need to be more alert on this variability, which is seasonal rather than an annual average. Uh, so this is something that I already mentioned. Uh, what I want to say about rain forecast, it will be more difficult also. There is going to be uncertainty of like how rain forecast will happen, especially in spring and in fall time, because those have high spatial and temporal variability. But on average, we expect a slight decrease on annual level. Uh, and what, what will happen is also that heat waves will be definitely more marked because dry soil tends to suck the heat wave for longer time. It has this suction effect that has dry soil. So we can see doubling to 2050. We can see like triple number of hot days in the winter, in the summer period, but also a doubling of length of heat waves. So these are all conditions that all together will have an, an impact on climate and ultimately on fresh water resources for sure. So fresh water availability uh, is likely to decrease substantially. Uh, the, the, the biggest factor that probably is, uh, is giving risk to water resources is that higher temperature will increase evaporation and evapotranspiration. There is going to be greater losses by reservoir water because of higher temperature. Also, the, the natural and semi-natural systems will consume more water. But in general, also the seasonality of stream flows is very likely to change. First of all, because in the northern part, we will have much earlier snow melt. So we will have in the northern part of the Mediterranean, where we have river basins which are fed by uh, snow melt, those will happen rather early and they will not able to sustain uh, fresh water in the summer time where they're really more important. While we might have more stream flow discharges at the end of fall, beginning of winter. So it's really important that uh, 
reservoir systems, either like dams, or, but also recharge of groundwater, will need to act really to be more resilient, to absorb and contain the system, but all, all together might, will probably decline. So this is another important and make in consideration, we put in consideration this with the resources and the needs for the Mediterranean. We have to understand that it's not just the climate risk, which has important effort, but it's also the dynamics that the Mediterranean will foresee in the future. So we will have actually, a, a, we will have uh, an increasing population, which already suffer water scarcity, and they might suffer even more water scarcity. And to sustain this population, there is going to be of food for them, which will require more irrigation. So there is going to be irrigated land, which is an important portion already of water consumption, but will be even more in the future, will have an important factor factor in consuming water resources, with increasing consumer water resources. Increase in water resources happen, especially in the summer, when there is conflict. This is another problem so of the seasonality. Climate change will increase risk, especially in the summer, in the Mediterranean. But in that same period, we have other sectors competing for water. Domestic like sectors that really need water, for drinking water for other purposes, but also tourism in certain areas are extremely important and they really depend heavily on water resources. Uh, so we will we, we see now that uh, this the, all this production and consumption for different sectors to guarantee some social security for the development of the Mediterranean is uh, interconnected with water resources. It will require more water resources and adaptation to the efficiency of water use as much as possible. What is it will follow up on water use, the efficiency of pumping water, the bring to treating water, to make available even waste water or the salinization systems of water have high consumption and mean on energies. So it will be all importantly connected in terms of efficiency for resources. So all of this, it's important to understand that the, 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 the best and most efficient use of water will have benefits on different components, on different sectors. And of course, what ultimately will mean, it will mean that there is gonna be more efficiency will bring a more availability to the downstream of, uh, of system on aquatic systems on wetlands, which are also extremely important also for food security in terms of fishing, but also in other ecosystem services like Alessio was mentioning. In general, we can say that results show Irrigation demand will increase by 10 to 20% for different crops across the Mediterranean. There is definitely like a variation, of course, where like the southern rim and the, and, and the west and the eastern more part might suffer more on average. But what is important, and maybe I want to really make here, uh, just show you, these are how changes of irrigation requirement are dependent on different crops. So different crops, they will see different, uh, they will see different demand, change in demand of irrigation requirement. Because the crop, their crop season mostly is variable, is different. So for instance, in the case of Sardinia, this is one case, we will see that the crop types are most affected are those with winter, spring, season growth, while other ones that are late in the summer will be less sensitive. So imagine if the future we will ask to be more efficient, that means likely also change in crop types that are gonna be distributed to follow better the availability of water. That means also 
changes in, in diet habits. There is going to be a lot to do in terms of this adaptation system. So this is important. Another important consideration is that, yes, indeed, uh, in the case of Sardinia, this is just an example. We have most of the, the uh, coastal area which are uh, um, which are devoted in part. Like there are going to be several parts of agricultural which is distributed in lowest part of Sardinia. Let's say, like in the southeast and uh, and in part in the west part area. And those might not see this is the green color show like the decrease of aridity. So it might not be so important that the strong the impact of aridity on this area, which are sensitive, which would show exposure to irrigated agriculture. While in reality, the strongest impact, for instance, in Sardinia is more in the central area is expected. So it might seem that this, the exposure, it's not so critical of those, uh, of those uh, agriculture, irrigated agricultural activity. But in reality, most of the reservoirs and most of the stream flow area comes from the center, from the highest area. So even there, we have to recognize it's just not seasonal displacement, it's also temporal. Like freshwater resources come from inner area, from higher area, which might be more sensitive to aridity in the future. So this is something also important to account that the area where water comes might be even more at risk being at higher elevation. Uh, just very rapidly, we will see then uh, important effect on yield losses uh, in agriculture in the Mediterranean. Warmer temperature might create some changing in cropping patterns in cropping season, but altogether it's might be more a risk of agricultural yield. What is important and what will be important in the future to sustain agriculture and food security, it's irrigation availability. So there is gonna be definitely a lot of implications of efficiency in irrigation, because that will be a must to help freshwater resources, groundwater resources especially, which can be more critically involved, especially in drought period, because what happens is we have freshwater resources generally from reservoir available over normal years. But when we have longer droughts, more prolonged droughts in the future, what will happen in those years is very likely that we will have more extraction of water from groundwater with all the problems that were mentioned before, like salinity intrusion, deterioration of water, groundwater resources. So all of these events of aridity will imply, for instance, water degradation, but also land degradation, much more abandonment of, uh, of agricultural area as associated with intensified mechanization when you have wet years. So wet to dry years, might likely also alter uh, and increase the certification in these areas. So altogether, we see that we, we, we touch climate, water, energy, land use, different sectors, different needs. They're all, all interlinked together. So what we realize is that all of these are resources are interconnected, all the sectors most sectors are conflicting for this. So when we have actions from one set on water resources, is possibly creating some displacement and problem in other important needs. So the importance of this integrated management has really pushed like approaches like the Nexus, where we, we are talking more and more importantly about interconnected and understanding all the different sectors, how to associate them together in order to have a more sustainable management of resources. Uh, this is something that has really picked up the Nexus concept uh, in different uh, uh, contexts in the last decade in the Mediterranean is definitely very extremely important for water governance. 
different sectors of the nexus are being brought together to analyze what is the effect of governance on water, energy, and food on different development goals. So that it's important to associate all of them together. And this is the key integrated approach in order to really res mitigate or really reconcile use from different sectors. And it's especially important because that is what really can safeguard also ecosystems. If we can find the reconciliation between different sectors to find integrated policy, at the end, we can probably include in that a higher priority for environmental flow requirements, which are extremely important for aquatic ecosystems. But as far as we are working on a silo thinking, just thinking from one sector alone on their own needs, we will not be able to integrate really all the other needs from other sector and most importantly, environmental flows. So I'm really presenting the Nexus example because as, although it has been really shifted mostly to water, energy and food, it is now really moving ahead on ecosystems, really. And, and the key here is really include ecosystem as a priority to represent the requirement objectively and try to give them a priority in an integrated approach. So I want, maybe I went a little bit more than the, the time allowed, I'm really sorry. I just, a few words, but I think I mentioned more of this. What is important on water resources and conflicts is that they're highly seasonal. This is something that we need to displace activity as much as possible. We need to know step on each other feet for water resources. Climate will have a strong impact in the summer time, especially, but we have a whole year, so we can really be more creative here. It's important as we do this, we will require changes, changes to, to manage better water resources in front of, of to cope with climate change. We will need changes in habits and the production consumption. It will not just be, I believe, a technological need in efficiency to save, but also we might need to have some bigger, more transformative adaptation changes. So uh, it's, uh, it's, 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 yeah, because it will be something that we need to leave behind to our next generations. So we need to push forward a dialogue for the long term with, and respecting, of course, political sovereignty, habits and cultural sovereignty. But I think this is really the key. So I, mm, so thanks for the attention. These are some of my colleagues beside me, Sara Masia, Valentina Mereu, Marta De Bolini. We are collaborating on water resources in the Mediterranean and agriculture. Contact us if you have more to ask, I will be happy. And if you have questions and time, I hope I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, for, for this very interesting and detailed talk. Um, yes, the, the scenario that you presented us is not really reassuring, I would say, but rather is a little bit scaring. Uh, we have now also better understood the current issues we are facing and that also limiting rise in temperatures requires mitigation, uh, not only in the, in the user natural resorts, I would say, but also in change and mentality and ethical responsibilities, as you mentioned in the last slide. Uh, so I don't know if there are some questions from the audience, actually. I don't see any from in the chat, but please uh, feel free to ask questions to, to Antonio. Um, okay, Mohamed Binada, yes, you can, you can do your question, Mohamed, to Antonio. Uh, merci, Dr. Antonio, for votre conference, très instructive. Uh, J'ai vu au début de la conference uh, un graphe que vous avez montré sur uh, l'évolution de la température, ça augmente jusqu'à 1940. 
Et après, il y a une phase où la température il baisse et ça reprend à partir de 1990. Est-ce que vous avez une explication Je n'arrive pas à comprendre cette baisse entre 1940 et 1990. Merci. Uh, I think I understood the question, but I, 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 let, me, let me see if I understood the question. So you're, you're, I'm sorry if I, I don't speak fluently French. Okay, but Antonio, if you, if you have the interpretation button, sorry, I forget to mention, uh, to mention uh, in case you can hear the, the, the tra tra translation real time. In any case. Yes. Sir. So. Uh, the, 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 the reality of this uh, graph I want to show here is that uh, this is, uh, uh, the, 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 has been, a, 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 this is like the zero means the, the temp is the anomaly, the change to temperature average between 1961 and 1990. So this can, is just- Can you share record. again the screen, Antonio, sorry. Uh, no, I lost the screen. Sorry, I was thinking. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Just to, to, to have the graph in front of us again. Can you see? Okay. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Voilà, ça. Sorry, Mohamed. Uh, voilà, so this graph that you probably refer to show zero. Zero is the change over the average between 1961 and 1990. So we know that in 1860 is half of a degree lower than the average. And 1940 is about as the average. And in 2000 is half of a degree higher. That's what the, the change means. It is true. And this is something that it really happened. It's from 1980 that you really have the strongest increase from the 80s, 70s to the 80s. But altogether, the 40s to the 60s were quite stable. They were really rainy, the, those 20 years. There, were ex, there was extreme rainfall events. So imagine that was a big power in dissipation of energy. So probably we had the feedback on those years in terms of hydrology. Merci pour votre réponse. Merci. Thank you, thank you, uh, Antonio. My pleasure. Uh, you. I will also wonder. The, um, this is a, a personal point of view, but with a rapid increase in demand for resources and contemporary loss of marine coastal ecosystem and biodiversity, uh, do you think that solution based on nature, as presented before by Alessia, would efficiently reduce such big impact in the short time span? And uh, for example, we have seen with the Nexus framework uh, that some of the information are all, and the risk of course are all interconnected. And so the decision makers start to understand this um, complex, I would say, system, but how to make it practically operative and how to communicate all these to, to, to countries, to governments in your opinion, because it's not easy since it's an, uh, an ongoing process, which is also um, changed quite rapidly. I think what? Well, from my side, one of the positive aspects of a nature-based solution and ecosystem-based approach in general is that they can refer also to the use of a natural infrastructure, which is something that we also have in our tradition in some in several instances. So there are several instances of using nature-based solution, which in reality, it's really linked to our traditional systems as well, but somehow in the mechanization process of agriculture, for instance, and other systems, we prefer a more intensive uh, engineered system to, to make easier, let's say, or more straightforward the exploitation of resources. But in reality, in the past, I think that the, our approach with the resources was more natural based in, in reality. So I think 
some of the solutions that we can propose come from the past as well. Some model will be new, absolutely new. There is no doubt because there are new challenges and new conditions to deal with. But we can really start to talk with people that people really have to deal more with and have a better perception of the dynamic of natural solutions. They can really function and be self-sustainable in the future, like it used to be in the past. Maybe that's a that's a message that will work better to a lot of dialogue, a lot of dialogue. A lot. Okay, great. Thank you, Antonio. I think you have another question in the in the chat. Uh, can, can you can you see it directly? I will. Uh... Uh, otherwise, I will uh, translate. But no, uh... oh, wait. Because I, was in, because I was in full mode, and uh, and uh, okay. now I'm not sure. Now I'm not sure if I. Sorry, wait to me. I have some problem here now. Ah oh, no, messages, chat, I see what it is. Yes, it's the last one, I think from an American colleague, uh, Zera Willy. I hope to have a, say the right pronunciation. Hey, okay. I'm not a, def, I'm not, I'm not a, an expert on soil uh, process and uh, soil edification processes. Yes. So, so, but, 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 but I definitely think that it's soil. It's a, it's it's a key process that I recognize that on uh, on fertility. If, uh, if we are able to maintain the spread quality, we can really, so in quality through different uh, measures. I know it's important to, to have these amendments in the soil to preserve the capacity, the, wa the water holding capacity of soil in the future, and also the, 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 the physical, the quality of soil. But that ultimately what really uh, help to sustain the uh, high yield, the highest possible yield without using much water or much fertilization. So it will be extremely important to have these adaptation measures because they will have a different impact on, uh, on water, use efficiency. I think it's important to have experiment to test them and to demonstrate also to the com rural communities. I really hope a lot of money really comes into that because it will be really important to spread the, 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 the good practices. Okay, I hope, great. I hope it was answering the question. <laughs> <My> <laughs> Middle French. And uh, sorry, Antonio, previously, previously you showed uh, um, uh, clear examples from Sardinia where mountains environments uh, are most impacted one and could does uh, directly affect even coastal habitats in turn. But it was just an example referring to Sardinia is a, a common uh, uh, um, phenomenon that has been recorded also in other countries and other circumstances, because it's quite curious in this sense. Yes, it is. Since for climate change, there has been, oh, that works in general, the mountains have, are sentinels of climate change. So the increase of temperatures are higher at higher elevation. So, it, of course, this is like a general rule. I'm sure there is a lot of like changes depends on the area, but expect to have like higher temperature changes over at a higher elevation. Okay, it, it was just a curiosity. Yeah, this sounds dramatic. I want to come back to what 
you mentioned at the beginning really about the dramatic of the situation. It is true, there, are, it, there, there is a big challenge ahead of us with climate change, but I really think that in our history, we have been coping with several climate change, climate risk in the Mediterranean. The challenge is big, but we can, we have been adapting, we can adapt, we should really push forward a transformative adaptation measure to reduce risk. I think it's 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 in our in our tradition in our culture to to be very adaptive as a Mediterranean people. And I wish the best. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you, Antonio. I don't know if there are any other questions from from the audience uh, in the chat. Please uh, is the moment. Uh, uh, otherwise, we have. I think that we have still uh, three minutes. Uh, Rather question, I finish mine, actually. Uh, Sometimes, uh, and this is, I, I have my that questions then. Yeah. <laughs> can, can, can you stop sharing the screen, Antonio? Yeah, I will. Okay. Yes, please. I, I have, I have a, something that it's really important to us. Ah, Mohamed as well as another question, probably. So, erase the end. Please. En fait, la, la main, je l'ai levée tout à l'heure, mais de toute manière, puisque l'occasion se... Euh, Docteur okay. Antonio, il a mis l'accent sur le conflit euh, concernant l'utilisation des eaux, et ça, ça, ça m'inquiète pour les zones humides. C'est vrai, on va se, se confronter à ce, cet usage. Il va y avoir des convoitises pour détourner les, les débits écologiques qui, qui, qui sont réglementaires. Et on devrait donc respecter autant que possible ces débits écologiques pour euh, préserver la vie... Euh, dans les rivières, la vie des poissons, des oiseaux. Et, et donc, c'est un grand défi, effectivement. Et il faut s'attendre à, à, à beaucoup de, de, de confrontements avec les, les, les décideurs et les gestionnaires des eaux. Merci, Antonio. Merci to you. à toi, Mohamed. I, I want to add one last note. From my side on this, it's very important when we do integrated management to have quantitative information, to be as quantitative as possible to the needs, to the water needs of aquatic systems. Because often we are making the case that it's important to keep environmental flow, but in governance, we need to make accounting. We need to say, they need so much water, aquatic system, wetlands. Every year, we need to preserve and give a priority. But it often it's very difficult to quantify. I know it's a challenge because they are complex systems, but it's very important for us to have that. So to work in that direction for ourselves means to give, to justify the priority and the needs of aquatic systems. It's something that we often miss, maybe at larger scale. There are some cases that are working very well in that direction, but that is something important. Right. Uh, okay. Thank exact. you. Merci. <laughs> Antonio, there is another question from Laila from Tetuan in Morocco, which asks, uh, uh, in your opinion, what are the uh, key measures, the adaptive adaptation measures to to take into consideration or to use? Yes, uh, it, it's, uh, it, uh, it's- Challenging it's, question. <laughs> yeah, challenging question, because there are a lot of adaptation measures. Of course, uh, let's say, we talk about agriculture and we talk about agriculture like, it, like in the field, there are a lot of agronomic adaptations. So it's important. But let's not forget that the distribution system usually has a lot of water losses. So, so channels, networks, lose a lot of water. So it's important also to work on infrastructure, to make those infrastructure efficient, connected also to technology. So that this distribution is smart, so they can be auto-regulated. In, in my impression, like we can maybe arrive at one point where we can also 
make decisions based on forecast one month, two months ahead. If we reach to that point where we can understand also the climate conditions ahead of us, like we have weather forecast one week, two weeks, reliable, but what if we have two, three months of reliable weather forecast? Maybe we can plan on the ground in agriculture, like conditions and planting and development most suited to be more efficient. Um, I, I would say this probably can be very, very, very given. Um, of course, all the, the, all the, I see a lot of adaptation that works well on its own, like making irrigation methods which are efficient. I think people realize that they, they implement those and they save a lot of water and a lot of money. So private people really could be even like faster than public system sometimes. Sometimes in public system, like mentioned, of water distribution, they are still at all the network systems. Those also needs to be really made more efficient. Okay, great. Antonio, I think that you have other two questions because Zera Yuli uh, raised the hands on the chat and then there is an, on the chat another question from Kadia. So you can, I think that we can give the possibility to speak to Zera Yuli and then ask uh, to Kadia and Rand as well. <laughs> other two questions. Please, Zera, Zera Yuli, you can. Talk. Can you hear me? Oh. I see the question from... Oui, euh, merci. Yeah, okay. euh, je tiens tout d'abord à vous remercier euh, de cette euh, présentation extraordinaire. Euh, moi, je voulais tout simplement attirer l'attention sur un fait que je trouve extrêmement important et euh, auquel on donne un peu d'importance. C'est celui de la séquestration du carbone dans les sols. Tout le monde sait euh, aujourd'hui que parmi euh, les grands problèmes de l'agriculture dans le monde entier, on voit qu'il euh, y a une dégradation de la teneur de la matière organique dans les sols, et ça par des mesures et des systèmes de culture inadaptés, inappropriés pour préserver la matière organique dans le sol. Et bien sûr, lorsqu'on dit la matière organique dans le sol, on parle du carbone. Ici au Maroc, on a mené euh, des essais euh, sur euh, les sols sablonneux. Les sols sablonneux sont très connus par la forte minéralisation de la matière organique et, et par conséquent des pertes énormes en carbone. Et euh, on a essayé d'améliorer euh, les niveaux organiques dans les sols sablonneux où il est très difficile de ramener euh, la matière organique à un niveau euh, requis pour euh, une bonne productivité et un bon rendement. Et sur le plan économique et environnemental, euh, il y a des impacts positifs. Et on a remarqué euh, qu'avec l'apport des argiles, euh, on dit des argiles saturées à basiques, qui ont des pH euh, donc supérieurs à 7, 5, 8, et on a euh, pu euh, développer ce qu'on appelle le complexe argileux humique dans les sols sablonneux qui ont la possibilité donc, de euh, séquercer du carbone dans le sol et par conséquent améliorer la matière organique du sol et synchroniser donc, la minéralisation de la matière minérale euh, dans ces sols qui seront donc, par la suite bien euh, un bénéfice important pour les cultures. Et en plus, préserver la matière organique, euh, la, la, les nappes aussi. Parce que lorsqu'on parle de matière organique, on parle de, effectivement du carbone, de sa castration du carbone, mais aussi de la minération de l'azote euh, qui donne des, des nitrates qui polluent euh, donc les, les nappes. Alors voilà ma, ma question, c'est d'inviter tout le monde à travailler sur la, les matières organiques et essayer d'améliorer ces, ces, ces niveaux. On remarque aussi que dans les sols euh, donc très lissivés dans les zones euh, équatoriales, où la matière organique est très faible et les sols sont très minéralisants et le pH est très acide, on va peut-être penser à l'avenir de faire un commerce de l'argile au lieu d'un commerce d'engrais qui va essayer d'apporter des, des argiles basiques euh, des zones où géologiquement parlant on a des gisements d'argile basique qu'on va faire un, un commerce d'argile euh, au niveau mondial pour améliorer ces sols qui sont acides et bien dissivés, euh, dégradés, etc. par ces apports d'argile. Et j'invite tout le monde à y travailler, à travailler sur... Euh, parce que le plus grand séquestrateur aujourd'hui, donc c'est une mesure d'atténuation importante, reste le sol. 
Et le sol, on y apporte peu d'importance. C'est vrai, il y a certaines initiatives euh, comme l'initiative 4C, euh, AIA au, en Afrique, etc. Mais je vois très peu de gens qui ont et essayer donc de, 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 de trouver des techniques appropriées. D'ailleurs, on en a trouvé ici au Maroc une mais je, malheureusement n'est pas encore généralisé euh, donc à travers que ce soit le Maroc. Ça, 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 ça s'implique aussi pour les sols méditerranéens. Je parle euh, des sols sablonneux. Ben voilà, je voulais tout simplement partager avec vous euh, cette, euh, cette, cette préoccupation pour moi et qui est d'une importance majeure pour l'humanité. Ceci dit, euh, le bon exemple aussi, c'est de voir des zones humides qu'on connaît au Maroc et qui avait au début des teneurs en matière organique de 8%, 9%, et avec euh, l'assèchement, l'assainissement, etc., elles ont été ramenées à 2%, 3%. Ça veut dire que tout a été largué dans l'atmosphère. Des, des, des trucs qui ont des, des, du carbone qui a été séquestré et qu'on l'a relargué euh, dans le système. D'où l'importance des unimides en tant que séquestrateurs du carbone et qu'il faut impérativement protéger. Voilà, je voulais tout simplement faire cette réaction. Je ne sais pas si vous partagez avec moi cette préoccupation. Merci. D'accord. <rire> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm looking through the how much sea level will rise in the next year. So huh, it's not clear. Eh? Might be something uh, there are several forecasts. I, I I I should really look also in the last IPCC report. I believe it was something between Wow, 25, 30 centimeters and alpha meter by the end of the, of the century. But let's keep in mind that this means just average. Then there are storm, which will be much more stronger. And I don't know, Flavio, do you see any other questions I missed? I see another question from Miranda Gurdi. Uh, Uh, thank you, Mr. Antonio, for this information. Did, yes. This phenomenon poses many dangers to the lives of animals and led to the destruction of their habitats, negatively affected people. All necessary measures must be taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's important also to understand that the risk of biodiversity and uh, it's, 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 will, be, will be strongly influenced by climate change. But let's remember also the land use dynamics will have an important aspect. So all the dynamics of to maintain activities, human activities, must be well managed eh, to respect biodiversity. Because one thing that will happen is with climate changes, there will be climate shifts of ecosystems because changes tend to go north with us become warm, warmer or also a higher altitude. Well, that's not the case for wetlands, unfortunately. But uh, you will see that you need to create corridor networks to really preserve those systems. And land use management is very important as well. I don't hear you now, Flavio, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I agree. And I also agree with the, uh, the last message from Laila that says the sensibilization of the uh, civil society could be probably one of the, the most important things and one of the most important fields where it needs to advance uh, in order to solve some, at least limit some of the issues that you present, uh, Antonio. Uh, you also mentioned that we have an ethical responsibility and we have to <laughs> change our habits according to the use of natural resources. Uh, so I think that this is just a very common message that could be adapted to many different contexts, but in this particular case is really, really uh, important. I don't know if you would like to close the meeting with a reflection about death or Thanks a lot, everybody. I think it's important, like, as a Mediterranean, like, we share a lot of problems to make this as something that unifies us, eh? these challenges, rather than splitting. Sorry for the problems with the sound, sorry. No, no don't worry, now it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, okay, so I don't know if 
There are other questions, I think, no. So probably uh, we can uh, end the, 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 the meeting. Uh, I would like just like to thank the, of course, the speaker of the day, Alessio and, uh, and, and Antonio, and all the participants from the Mediterranean and from abroad. And of course, the translators, uh, my colleagues, Sana and up there, uh, that helped us to uh, make the, the meeting very smoothly. And uh, I just remember, as Sana uh, and up there reported on the chat, that for those interested, uh, you can find all the previous webinars uh, recording of the same series at our website. So the link is shared in, on the chat. So thank you for participating and see you at the next uh, opportunities. And Flavio, uh, let me yeah. thank you, of course, for your role and uh, for facilitating and coordinating. Thanks again to Antonio and to all the participants. Uh, great question, good answers. <laughs> so to see you soon. And uh, also please get in touch with us, write back. Uh, we need your feedbacks. We'll also need uh, your suggestions in preparing new webinars and new activities that will be useful for you. You can follow MedWet work also in the medwet.org site. Uh, so don't hesitate to come back to us. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Merci, au revoir. Bonne journée. Bonne journée. Merci à tous. Bye. Merci, au revoir. Au revoir.